Okay, welcome back. So, we have looked at the resolution method and the resolution rule. What does the resolution rule say? For propositional logic, it says that if you have a set of clauses, union the clause not q and if you have another set of clauses which I am not writing here, but union the, the clause q. So, these two q and not q are singleton clauses. Then in the resolution rule, you remove not q, you remove q and you take the union of these two sets and make it as a new clause. So, let us apply that to our uh, favorite pro problem, the Alice problem. So, if you remember that these are the, this, this is the knowledge base given to us, P and Q, P implies R, R or S implies T, not Q or S and not U or V, not U or and not V. So, we have to first convert this into clause form. This is not in clause form essentially. Okay. How would we make it into clause form? We would make this a separate clause and make this a separate clause. Okay. So, we do not want to keep that. So, that those are two clauses. We will translate this into not P or Q, which becomes into, which becomes a clause. So, now we have three clauses. We will translate this one into, and you should work this out, not R or not S or T. So, that is the fourth clause that we have. Uh, the fifth formula Q, not Q or S is already in clause form. And the last one, we will break it down into two clauses. So, we will end up having uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 clauses. Now, it is in clause form. Each clause has only a disjunct inside essentially. Okay, so, this is what we are trying to do. This is just the conjunction of this whole this whole tautology that we want to show to be true and uh, we take each of the premises and convert it into a clause which is what I just showed. Uh, the first premise P and Q gives us two clauses as does the last one. We also add the negation of the goal uh, not T as a clause to the system and then we repeatedly apply the resolution rule essentially. What does the method say? That just take two clauses which can be resolved together and resolve them and add the resolvent to the knowledge base till you have derived the empty clause or the null clause. It has been shown that this method is decidable for propositional logic. What does it mean to say it is decidable? It means that there is an algorithm which will always terminate by saying yes or no essentially. So, it is sound and it is complete and it is decidable. So, let us do that with our this thing. As we said, these are the clauses now. Notice that in every line, the only logical connective is either not or or essentially. Hmm. The and is kind of reflected in the fact that each of them, it is the first clause and the second clause and the third clause and the fourth clause and so on. So, that is the CNF form essentially. So, these are the eight clauses, the eighth one has come because we added the negated goal as well to the set. And now, we want to show that this leads to deriving the empty clause, which we have convinced ourselves would mean that this set of eight formulas put together as a large conjunct is going to be unsatisfiable. So, here is the proof for that. First, from 4 and 8, what is 4? and 8. 8 has got as you can see not t, 4 has got t, we will remove that and what we get is not r or not s. Then from 1 and 3, we will remove not p and p and produce r. So, Notice that this is doing the same thing as what modus ponens was doing. Modus ponens said that P and P implies R, you can add R and this rule is doing also the same thing. It is saying that from P 
and not P or R, you add R. So, it is not that we are doing something radically different, it is just that the form is different and therefore, the rule that we are applying is different. Then we get uh, not S from 9 and 10. So, the two last two things we derived, we can cancel not R and R, we get not S. We get not Q from 11 and 5. So, the last thing we had was not S and then 5 says not Q or S. So, we can cancel that Q. Eleven says not S, and from not S, and so this not S we cancel with this S, and we get not Q. And then from not Q and Q, Q is clause number two, we get the empty clause. So we have shown that this set of formula is unsatisfiable. Remember that what we have now at this stage is these thirteen formulas. Uh, we have the conjunct of these thirteen formulas. So P and Q and not P or R and so on and so forth right up to the end where we have not S, not Q and empty clause. But the empty clause is evaluates to false and therefore, this whole empty whole formula will evaluate to false because it is something and something and something and something and false. Is it? Why does the empty clause evaluate to false? As we can see here, we got it from not Q which is here and we had Q which was uh, uh, clause number 2 and we got the empty clause. What is not Q and Q? It is obviously a contradiction. So, if I were to write it as not Q and Q, then there is nothing that will make this true essentially. And that is what implicitly we are saying. There is an implicit and between 1 and 2, 1 and 3, 1, 3 and 4 and every, every way. We can also show the proof as uh, a directed acyclic graph, which is often more convenient when we are talking about the resolution method. Though when you implement it, you will implement it as uh, uh, something different. The clause in orange, which is not T is the is a negated goal essentially. So, the same steps that we did in some order you can do them and eventually you have derived the null clause essentially. Now, there can be many choices that you can make we have said as to which two rules to pick here. So, in, in the animation that I showed you we picked uh, this as the first rule then we picked this as the second rule and so on. So, if you go back and see this was first rule this was the second rule then and so on. But you could have done them in any order essentially, as long as you derive the null clause. So, here is an alter alternative derivation in which we use not t only in the end and you can see that what you see in the gray part is the proof of the proposition t. That is what we wanted in the original place to show that t is true. We can use the resolution rule to arrive at t here as we can see here. Uh, but it is not complete for arriving at, at, at as at arriving at positive uh, goals essentially. What Robinson showed was that if you add this do this last step of adding the negation of the goal, then you can always derive the null clause essentially. So, let us move to first order logic which is what we are studying. We use the term clause form in first order logic and in first order logic we say that a formula is in clause form if it has this particular structure where all the quantifiers are on the left and there are only the universal quantifiers. Now, you might recall that we had a uh, find a way of we had uh, devised a method for uh, uh, representing formulas in the implicit quantifier form and the in, in some sense that is what we are doing here also. So, in the implicit quantifier form if you remember we eliminated the existential quantifiers totally and we did that by using either scolum functions functions or smolum constants. So, in the clause form we have a set of clauses each C i is a clause made up of a disjunction of literals as before and each literal is an atomic formula or its negation. 
the clause has only universal quantifiers and the consequence of having universal quantifiers is that we can ignore them essentially. And if that is all we have, the only quantifiers we have are the universal quantifiers, then we can ignore them and writing programs would of course become simpler essentially. We do not have to add extra text. In other words, we are working with the implicit quantifier form essentially. Again, it can be shown that every formula can be converted to clause form and this was shown by Skolem, Thoralf's Skolem and that is why we use that phrase Skolemization there and the Skolem functions and so on. It begins by taking an existential closure of the formula alpha that is given to us. So, if there is any free variable inside, then we put an existential statement outside that. So, this is the procedure for converting this into clause form, standardized variables apart across quantifiers. We have seen that that is necessary because otherwise unification may not work sometimes. We saw that if two different formulas had uh, used the same uh, variables, then you cannot unify them. If you remember the example was something like this, that if we have p and a and x, where a is a, um, a is a constant and x is a variable and if we had p and x and b, then we could not unify these two formulas. Why? Because Either you can say x equal to a or you could say x equal to b, you cannot do both. Whereas, using the fact that you have used x in the first formula and also x in the second formula is not a great idea because what you are saying is that for every x, for every element in the domain p is true, p a x is true and for every element in the domain p x b is true. So, you might as well say for every element y in the domain p y b is true. So, if you replace this by y and that will not change the meaning of the formula, then they will unify because then you would say uh, uh, y is equal to a and x is equal to b and your unification will work. So, that we saw is called standardizing variables across quantifiers. Eliminate all occurrences of operators other than and or and not. This is what you would do if you were doing the CNF form. Push the negation operator all the way in use de Morgan's law. So, remember we had this de Morgan's law uh, which said that if you move push the negation inside, it changed the structure of the formula. If it was an AND, it would change it to OR and if it was uh, a universally quantified formula, it would become an existentially quantified formula, which are both of these are similar events, but you can do that. Push the quantifiers to the right, so that ensures that the scope is as tight as possible. So, you know that which quantifier is talking about which sub formula. Eliminate the exist, uh, existential quantifier, this is through the process of scolomization. The variables which are existentially quantified will be replaced either by scolom functions or by scolom constants. Move the universal quantifier all the way to the left and that can be done and you can try that out. Distribute AND over OR, that is because we want to have the formulas in clause form, where each clause is a disjunct and the set of clauses is joined together by an AND essentially and then simplify. So, let us look at a small example just to illustrate this algorithm, but you should construct some arbitrary first order sentences and convert them into clause form and you will see that normally the length of this formula will increase essentially. Okay, so, one step I missed which is that after you have simplified you rename variables again, so that you have this standard uh, you have standardized them apart essentially. So, here is a formula, it is a somewhat random formula. Uh, uh, you could try and interpret it if you want. Our interest is not into understanding what this is saying, 
uh, but what this is saying is that why is some girl and for all boys x they like y or there exists an x and there exists a z such that x is a boy and z is a girl and x loves z basically. So, some random formula, uh, but we want to see how to convert this into clause form. So, first of course, we want to standardize variables apart. You can see that there are two occurrences of x here, uh, one in the universal quantifier on the left and one on the existential quantifier there. We simply re rename them by the second one by a different variable name essentially and we have done that here by calling it x1 essentially. Then we eliminate uh, the, uh, the implication connective and replace it by not and or. So, we know how to do that. Then in the third step that was there in the algorithm there is no change in the fifth uh, sorry fourth step and fifth step there are no changes and we are left with this formula where this is the same formula which is there in 3 because there is no change from there to here, uh, but I just rewritten it in a more readable format and what we do next is that we move the universal quantifier to the left. The first step I, I kind of forgot to mention is that you first put an existential quantifier at the end for any free variable. Why was a free variable there and we do that. So, this is what we have. Uh, now, we have a formula which has only universal quantifiers and so there should have been another universal quantifier x 1. No, there is only one only one quantified variable. So, all the others are scolum constants. None of them is a scolum function of anything. So, all these are scolum constants. Whatever name we give it does not matter they are scolum constants and there is only one variable which is x. So, we distribute and over naught and we get a slightly bigger formula, you should work this out. Separate the clauses and standardize the variables apart and in the end this is what we get, we set of clauses. So, each line in this or each row in this last formula is a clause and in the clause has a whole bunch of scolum constants and there is uh, some scolum, some universally quantified variables. In the original formula, if you remember, there was only one universally quantified variables, the others were existentially quantified, they remain existential. So, this gives us some idea of how to convert this into clause form and uh, now we will look at some proofs in first order logic. As before, we will start with our favorite Alice problem and then look at some problems that we could not solve earlier and look at some things which are more interesting. So, we will do that in the next video.